Crystal gazing has for centuries been the favorite method of the mystics to induce clairvoyant knowledge of the past, present, and future. But whereas there may be little science in crystal gazing, there is today much crystal gazing in science. Studies and researches into the mysteries of the crystalline structure of matter, for many of nature's materials are crystalline, and much has been learned of the relationships between these crystals and how a substance behaves. Crystals grow out of the atoms of a solution or molten solid, much as plants and animals grow, although the process itself is different. Just as a given seed always grows into the same sort of plant, so do given atoms always grow the same sort of crystal. Here we have an experiment you can try yourself at home. By dissolving in hot water a large amount of sodium sulfate, that is, pure globular salts, just as much as the water will hold, and then allowing the solution to cool without being disturbed, we produce what is called a supersaturated solution. In other words, more of the salt is dissolved than the water wants to hold at the cooler temperature. But there it is, and still nothing happens. Now if we merely disturb the solution slightly, say by means of a pencil point, we upset the balance, like giving it a push, and right away the excess salt separates out rapidly growing chains and branches of crystals, the typical crystals of sodium sulfate. Here's what they look like under the microscope, and globular salts always look like this. Crystal shape, you can see, is a valuable help in quickly identifying many substances. Metallurgists, the men who develop all the marvelous new steels and other alloys, are probably the most ardent crystal gazers in science. For the behavior of a metal or alloy under heat and mechanical stress is inseparably related to its crystal structure. The pattern which the microscope reveals on a polished and etched section cut through the crystals or grains of a metal is visible evidence of its crystal structure, like a map as it were. Metals ordinarily are composed of millions of microscopic crystals. But here is a piece of metal rod which, although it looks ordinary enough, is actually a single big crystal of zinc, just one crystal grown by a special cooling process to study single crystal behavior. And much like human beings, crystals behave differently alone than when in a crowd. For instance, here we are stretching a single zinc crystal in a testing machine, pulling it like molasses candy. Now, of course, where it stretches and draws out, it gets smaller but we'd expect it to stay round. As the sample shows, an ordinary rod does stay round. The single crystal, however, does not keep its circular cross-section. Instead, when it comes out of the machine, the stretched part is flattened, has the shape of an ellipse rather than that of a circle. Furthermore, we can see the diagonal lines on the surface, where the planes or layers of the crystals have slipped on each other. This shows that individual crystals act differently in different directions. The same thing can be shown in another way. An ordinary copper rod of this size would be quite difficult to bend by hand. But this single crystal bends easily one way. Try to bend it back again, however. It's quite a struggle. The crystal planes have slipped easily in one direction, but once they have slipped, they seem to lock themselves against a return trip. Studies of single crystals have already explained certain things about the behavior of metals which before were not understood. Over in another field of science, radio, we again find crystals performing vital functions. Remember the old crystal set, the earphones, the faint but thrilling signals? Most of all, the frantic searching for a sensitive spot with the so-called cat whisker so you wouldn't miss the best part of the program. Perhaps it was the Dempsey Carpentier fight or the first World Series broadcast. In those old sets, it was a little crystal of galena, a type of lead ore which detected the signals and brought in that, well, not very distant program. But although the old crystal of galena has given way to the vacuum tube and cat whiskers again come only on cats, another kind of crystal plays a vital part in modern radio. Did you ever wonder why you could always get the same station at a certain number on the dial or by merely pushing a button?
It is done at the transmitter by a tiny slice cut from a natural crystal of quartz. It is the job of this little glass-like wafer to control absolutely the frequency or wavelength of a big radio station to see that the number of kilocycles stays always the same. Sandwiched between two flat metal plates and connected to the proper electric circuit, this little slice of quartz becomes what is called a piezoelectric oscillator and will vibrate at a frequency or speed which depends on the thickness of the slice. The thinner the crystal, the faster it vibrates. The thinnest one you see here will vibrate at the almost unbelievable speed of 10 million times per second, 10,000 kilocycles in radial language. The vibrations, of course, are very small. You can't see them, you can't feel them, but they're big enough to be amplified electrically. Here is the raw material for hundreds of little oscillators, pieces of huge natural quartz crystals imported from Brazil. If you look closely, you can see quite well that nature makes them all the same shape, regardless of size. Cutting the oscillator wafers is a painstaking process for not only are the crystals very hard, but the cuts must be made in very accurate directions through the crystal. Otherwise, the resulting wafer just won't work properly. Remember the directional behavior of the copper crystal? Quartz, too, has its directional peculiarities. A quartz crystal has what is called an optical axis, about so, a mechanical axis, about so, and an electrical axis, about so. A slice for a precision oscillator must be cut in a direction which makes certain angles with each of these axes. Making the finished oscillator involves a number of cutting and grinding operations. Slicing through the natural crystal with steel discs buttered with abrasive paste. An x-ray inspection in which each slice is set for the right grinding angle. Rough grinding of faces to this exact angle and a fine grinding operation called lapping, which makes the surfaces extremely flat and parallel and brings the wafer to within a thousandth of an inch of the needed thickness. But as yet, the crystal is only approximately finished, for expert hand lapping is still needed to make it oscillate at the desired frequency. Skilled operators lap and test to lap and test until the thickness of the wafer has been so precisely achieved that it will vibrate at a frequency accurate to five one thousandth of one percent. Each crystal has an individuality, and the final work on each one is so exacting that from one to several hours may be spent on it before it can be marked OK. OK to be mounted like a sandwich filling in the little holder in which it will operate. OK to be the controlling element of a big radio transmitter whose high power tubes amplify the tiny crystal vibrations millions of times and send them out and up to be broadcast, carrying the messages, the news, the music of all the world. Okay to make certain that the station you want is always on the same frequency, will always come in at the same place on the dial. <laughs> So with the playing of Old Lang Syne, we conclude today's broadcasting activities for WGY. WGY operates on a frequency of 790 kilocycles by authority of the Federal Communications Commission. And through the peculiar ability of a slice of crystal quartz discovered and applied usefully by science. Just another example of how science, by looking ahead today, sees the forerunners of more and better things tomorrow. <laughs>